be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark. Glory, Glory to you, you, Lord Christ. Immediately after the broken pieces of bread and the fish were gathered up, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After saying farewell to them, he went up on the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. When he saw that they were straining at the oars against an adverse wind, he came towards them early in the morning, walking on the sea. He intended to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and, say, and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, for their hearts were hardened. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. We are hungry, Lord. We are hungry for that which gives life and sustains us day by day. Come and fill us with the power of your word. Nourish us in the truth and feed us with your love. This we ask in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes, divine intervention has its limitations, especially when our fears get the best of us. It almost always clogs the vision and the insight that Jesus is wanting to give us in and through his miracles. One of those miracles, a couple of years ago, was getting me into a kayak. I do not like being in the water, especially when I cannot see the bottom of the lake. I'm okay with being in a boat with a motor on it and a reasonable sense of security that we are not going to sink. However, a kayak is another story. And between Emily's persuasion and the Lord's reassurance that I was not going to perish, I do know how to swim. I got into the kayak. And for some reason, I was okay when I looked down. Even after we got out from where you could see the bottom of the lake, I was okay paddling around in the calm waters. And then we turned the point out of the cove and hit a wind head on. And there were little white caps on the lake that were breaking over the bow of the kayak. <laughs> now, I played brave. <laughs> I turned to Emily and she was paddling next to me. I said, I'm okay if you're okay. <laughs> and she said, no, nah, it's too much work going into the wind. Let's turn around. And that's when it got really scary. Because as I turned, I discovered that Kayaks like to wobble on the waves. I paddled faster than I've ever paddled before. And we turned around and got back into the safe harbor, and all was well. The disciples were sent on by Jesus because he knew what they would encounter. And he knew that they needed an exercise in faith. How did he know this? He's God, for starters. He knows everything. 
On top of that, he knew that they hadn't gotten what had happened with the feeding of the 5,000 that just precedes what we read for this morning. And so there they are, out on the lake, as he's sitting up on the mountainside praying, talking with the Father. And he notices that they're having a hard time with it. And being the consummate teacher as well as the perfect Savior, he walks out on the water, saying to the world and to the disciples, if they had had enough faith to see him, that he's above all of it, that his power and his grace and his mercy are above all of the human circumstances that we face, even the storms and the wind on the Galilean lake. And he's going to pass them by until they start screaming that they're seeing a ghost on top of huddling over each other, trying to get that boat to the other side of the lake. And he takes pity on them. Just as he did the crowds that ran ahead and met them on the other side of the lake that led to the feeding of the 5,000. And he calms the seas climbs into the boat, and we hear again this wonderful connection that we need to hear time and time again. They were amazed and they were disbelieving because their hearts were hardened and they hadn't even seen the miracle for what it was in the feeding of the 5,000. And I wonder sometimes, I wonder how it is this ragtag group of disciples, led by Peter who puts his foot in his mouth time and again, and by James and John, James' feast was yesterday, by James and John who are constantly jockeying for the number one spot, the others squabbling among themselves and Judas doing what Judas does, I wonder how it is they ever got to the point where they finally understood what Jesus was about. The power and the glory and the majesty that he represents. How did they finally come to see that? James was the first of the twelve to, to die for faith in Jesus. So we know that for James and for the others, the message finally did get through. They put Jesus ahead of everything else, these 12, well, except for Judas. How? How does somebody like Paul, who wrote the letter to the Ephesians that the portion that Sandra read for us today. How does Paul come to encourage other believers? He who couldn't bring himself to believe that Jesus was the Messiah and persecuted the church because of it. How? Because Paul is sharing a message with the church that tells us very clearly that Jesus is the conquering king. And that this conquering king, unlike the conquering kings of the ancient world, when he won the war, when he fought the battle and was victorious, he didn't demand tribute from the conquered people. He gave them gifts instead. Gifts that some should be teachers and evangelists and pastors and other things. Jesus the victor, Jesus who calms the storms and, and feeds thousands with just a few loaves and fish. How did Paul come to see that? How did the disciples come to see that? I want to draw us really close and very 
intimately in to the story from the Old Testament for this morning. Because it's there. Elisha is following Elijah around and he knows what's going to happen. He knows. He says so. He knows that Elijah is about to be taken by the Lord, assumed into heaven. And he says so again and again as he's confronted by the other prophets who, who have an inkling to this as well. And they get to the Jordan and Elijah does what he does with his mantle and they cross through the Jordan on dry land and Elijah says to Elisha, what do you want from me when I go? And Elisha says, I want a double portion of your spirit. Do you know what he's saying there? Only the firstborn son gets a double portion of the father's inheritance. And he's saying to Elijah and to the Lord, I want to be your heir. You are my father. Bless me. Fill me. Use me. Steady me. And this is what happens. Isn't it interesting that as, as Jesus' public ministry, that three-year time span, as he turns his face, as the scriptures say, to Jerusalem, meaning he's turning his face to his passion, death, and resurrection. Isn't it interesting that these exchanges between Elijah and Elisha are so reminiscent for those of us who are looking backward of the exchanges that take place between Jesus and the Twelve? Especially at the Last Supper, when Peter pipes up and says, I'll go with you all the way, Lord. Question for us this morning. As we pray, as we worship, as we live and breathe and move about and go through our daily routine. Are we crying out for a double portion of Jesus in our lives? Are we asking him for more of him? Always, always more of him. Are we declaring with Elisha and with the disciples as they finally get it? Are we declaring that we want the Spirit of God to live within us in such a way that we can never go back, that we are forever changed, that what we used to like, we just no longer have a taste for, because we have tasted of the Spirit of God and we have found that nothing compares to it. There are gifts, as the scripture tells us, that the Lord has implanted in each one of us. As we ask for a double portion of his spirit, those gifts will come forward. It might be for evangelization, it might be for teaching, it might be for caring, it might be for any other number of things within the body of Christ. Here's the thing. We have only to ask. The Apostle James tells us that we have not because we ask And he's speaking from experience. In his time with Jesus, 
he and the other 12 and the other apostles and disciples and bishops and lay people, all of the church down through history, they have all learned this one lesson. That we will not receive a double portion of God's spirit unless we ask. Unless we open ourselves to him. So as we come and we receive Jesus, his precious body and blood this morning, come with an asking heart. Come asking for a double portion of what you are receiving. Come asking to be filled with the things of Thank you that you have called us your children and that your heart is always to teach us and to move us forward in your presence. Father, we do ask you for a double portion of your spirit. We do ask you to come and live within us mightily. And we do ask you use us mightily. Father, we offer ourselves before you, giving you thanks 